10 a.m. in Lagos, Nigeria. Time for Business Morning on Channel Television. You're welcome to 55 Minutes of Great Business. Talk, Amini, John Mekwa. Well, let's start from the global oil space. Prices climb today with investors regaining some risk appetite as they await clues from the U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman on potential interest rate rises. And some oil producers continue to struggle to beef up output. Brent crude features gained 40 cents to $81.27 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude features rose 52 cents to $78.75 a barrel after falling 0.8%. Yesterday, a weaker U.S. dollar helps support oil prices today as it makes oil cheaper for those holding other currencies. A U.S. Uh, Senate committee holds hearings this week for the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell and Vice Chair nominee Lyle Brynard that could provide new details about the U.S. central bank's plans to tighten monetary policy. Libya, which is exempt from OPEC supply curbs, has been hit by pipeline maintenance work and oil field disruptions. However, on Monday, production resumed at the El Fiel oil field, where an armed group halted output last month. The market is waiting on the U.S. oil and product inventory data from the American Petroleum Institute, which is due today, followed by data from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, which is due tomorrow. And the International Monetary Fund says emerging economies could face turbulence as the U.S. Federal Reserve raises interest rates and world economic growth slows due to COVID-19 Omicron variant. According to the IMF, this move by the Fed could rattle financial markets and trigger capital outflows and currency depreciation abroad. The global lender, due to release fresh global economic uh, forecasts, uh, on the 25th of this month, says it expects robust growth to continue in the U.S. with inflation likely to moderate later in the year. Come to Nigeria now where the Securities and Exchange Commission says it is set to launch a revised version of the 10-year capital market master plan. Later this year, a statement issued by ICC says that revised version of the policy aims to reflect the dynamism of the capit capital market and development in financial technology. The statement adds that the policy will create incentives that will enable companies such as the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited and Dangote Refinery to list on its registered trading platforms. The Nigerian Capital Market Master Plan 2015 to 2025 is a blueprint for developing Nigeria's capital market within 10 years. And now we'll take a short break. After that, we head to our commodities market segment, and we have Bolanle Agbaje sitting by to tell us some of the developments uh, in the commodities market segment and, of course, factors that affect commodities. She's analyst with Financial Derivatives Company. You'll join us again. It's Business Morning on Channels Television. Done. Now, in the month of December 2021, the Central Bank of Nigeria withdrew consistently from the reserves a total of $634.1 million to close the year at $40.52 billion, compared to $41.1 uh, which was uh, the rate at the beginning of December 2021. And so far in 2022, records have it that the CBN withdrew $21.5 million in the first six days of this year 2022 to meet forex demands and now we see that external reserves is flat at 40.50 billion dollars well we have bolanli agbaji analyst with financial derivatives joining us to share their observation that is of financial derivatives and expectation on the reserve and other important issues that uh, concern the commodities market segment good to see you happy new year this is Thank the first you. time we're seeing Thank this you. year <laughs> all right uh, so we see that uh, the reserve is flat at, at this time yes uh but uh, we saw that there was a, a lot of demand towards the end of the year yes. beginning of the i guess that's normal it's, at this, yeah, at this it's time it's definitely normal you see a lot of you know um, um new entrants into the market you know um so many people come to visit their family members and after this they're trying to go back home some of them trying to get you know their pta and also school runs to those that are trying to go back to school as well they also you know are added to the demand for the dollars but the the cbn has you know done a good job at maintaining the external reserves and protecting the value 
of the Naira. So what about remittances? These people that are coming should also, I mean, we should also get the remittances. We, we Isn't that it was so low, that's why we didn't really feel yes, the impact? It, it was definitely there, but it was quite low, definitely because of the, you know, Omicron variant, Omicron variant that actually started in the beginning of December when, you know, we had some lockdowns that were, you know, imposed in the UK and some other countries. And, you know, I think that affected, you know, most of the plans for most people to come back. But they still did, but I don't think, you know, they spent, spent as much time and even brought as much money into the market. So we didn't really feel the impact as much. So is the heavy demand over? What do we expect uh, henceforth? Um, the, he the heavy demand is not necessarily over, but it's quite stable at we the moment. We still have school runs. A yeah, lot we of definitely runs. still have school runs up till the end of January. Most people are usually, you know, most people usually travel abroad during the month of January for to resume, you know, school in most of these countries. So we definitely would not see that heavy demand, but stable demand for the forex is this what is affecting uh, uh the movement of the naira over the weekend uh, yes. we saw that it was i think it's 419 or 416 in the window, yes. yeah in the and, and window. also in the parallel market we saw an appreciation which is great um and definitely we didn't see any movement in the external reserve so it means that the central bank is not releasing as much you know dollars at the moment because I, I don't think there's any need to now to create that kind of uh, uncertainty in the market but what is this doing to the the commodity space, all of this reserve and movement of the Naira. So right now, it's not doing so much in the commodity space. We're seeing that prices are quite stable and more or less low. Average pri average domestic prices are quite low at the moment, which is great. Um, although when you compare the prices last year, last year we had seen a much more decline in mm. the um, um, commodity. Well, looking at a range of commodity prices, but this time the, the decline is not as much as we saw last year. And I think that's also what contributed to this was also the harvest season and the fact that we're seeing consumer resistance when it comes to increasing demand for commodities within the market. And I think uh, towards the end of last year, we saw uh, some items, uh, I guess because of the harvest, the yes. price moderated. Yes, so some of some items like beans, tomatoes, we saw re moderation in the prices. And we didn't see, you know, the rate, the, the price hike that we'd usually see in, the, in December. The price hike wasn't that much compared to, you know, previous years. But also, between December and January, we usually see a, a, a drastic decline in commodity prices because, you know, that increased demand has more or less significantly dropped. But that's not the case at the moment. Just because we did not see the increase in demand as much and also the, the, the fall in prices is not so uh, significant at the moment. Okay, so well. I know this is not uh, part of your slide, but, I mean, we also see that uh, the price of gas... Yes. <laughs> no, but gas has always been an issue within the country just because we don't produce enough. Mm. So the price of gas would always, you know, be affected by the but supply. But the government says it's moderating because of increases <laughs> supply. Well, according to them, you know, they've made, they, they, they've made improvements in that Have space. Have you seen a moderation in your end? Um, from I our end, not necessarily, so. no. Okay. But I'm sure, you know, you know, when you're increasing supply, it takes time. It's not something that is immediate in the market. They've made initiatives, yes, but the increase, the actual increase that would affect prices would come in the following months, not drastic. Okay. So I guess I'll continue using my yeah. firewood until, no. <laughs> until I see that. <laughs> 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 and then uh, the U.S. Fed, I mean, uh, it's like the whole world is tied around the United is, States. Yes. Everyone is waiting to pay their prayer. Everyone is <laughs> anticipating. Some, you know, analysts mentioned that they expect, you know, at least four rate hikes. Some are talking about three rate hikes. Just because, you know, it's been, it's been a long time coming. We're seeing, hopefully, shifts from this COVID situation. And, you know, most economies are trying to get the economies back to where it was pre-pandemic um, levels. And, you know, and also whatever happens in the u.s affects majority of because the, world. the dollar is like the world yes uh, exactly and you know it's, it's the reason why the imf even released a statement about how emerging markets should position themselves you know we we do know that the fed is going to do uh, carry out some rate hikes we don't know the number but um they've mentioned that emerging markets should brace themselves and more or less increase you know interest rates as well to protect their currency protect their economy um right now nigeria is not you know, positioned in that 
space just because you know we had seen inflation decline for about eight consecutive months and you know the, the, the right thing to do in this moment is more or less to f f reduce interest rates. The MPC so, is coming I mean 24th so yes yeah, so it's, it's most likely something they might consider we do expect that that's that that should be something they talk about because it's it's it's, it's a no-brainer in economics when you have a situation where inflation keeps declining almost leaning towards price stability we do expect you know interest rates to decline and uh, uh, in that line the world bank has also projected nigeria will have one of the highest inflation rates globally and the seventh highest in sub-saharan that sounds really scary it does it does in the sense that you know our target level is currently at about nine percent and we're way above it at um hope for 15.9 percent hopefully to decline to about between 14 and 15 percent it's definitely high but um I, I'm, I'm sure that you know the, the cbn is not as worried because they're definitely working towards it and just because we had seen this decline for the um, eight consecutive months i think it's something that it's something positive to look forward to except something drastic happens in the year 2022 although we're looking at the budget how the government is going to fund the budget mm -hmm. tax issues mm -hmm. you know those are tax scary. issues a major one yes. we discussed that yesterday yes so you know they mentioned that you know they're increasing um sh tax on carbonated drinks and the nigerian labor congress had come in to mention that you know they're not everybody's talking they're manufacturers association lives I'm exactly because I, ideally, if they're actually going to target, you know, health of many individuals, <laughs> which I don't think is the forefront of many individuals within Nigeria, yeah. um, it, it will make sense to actually target sugar. You know, tax yeah, but they call sugar. it sugar tax. That's yes, what they're but they're it. targeting the final product, which <laughs> would directly uh, affect consumers and affect, you know, the living standards of many And affect more people, anyway. Exactly, as opposed to, you know, targeting you know some of these companies and manufacturing companies and even at that some of these manufacturing companies they, 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 the revenues are quite squeezed at the moment so increasing tax i know hands are tied you know they're looking for ways to boost our revenue without you know borrowing so much from the external so because our debt levels are already very high so i i'm sure because we have over six trillion naira to exactly mm -hmm. so it's 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 a tight one for the government at the moment mm. but uh, i'm sure they would definitely find yeah you, you know you talk about the inflation and the fact that for eight consecutive months now we've been seeing a moderation also brings to the question the impact of those moderation you know yes. do people really feel it i know that uh, uh speaking to your ceo some time ago he yes. did talk about i mean considering what makes the basket of commodities that is used you know yeah, to yeah, measure yeah. inflation so that we can feel it if we say there's a moderation in figure let's feel it in, 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 in the market well, when you're looking at you know the direct necessities of individuals energy prices you know um, that that's for for prices you know the basket of goods that are actually consumed within the economy you know the staples rice beans all of that you know we're see we're definitely seeing prices decline but prices are relatively high compared to you know previous years so the living standard is not definitely going to be definitely so great better. and definitely I, I understand the fact that he mentioned that you know looking at what baskets of goods are they really using to compute inflation but that, i think that's another story for another <laughs> and i guess that's, but do you think we can escape this warning by the world bank is there a way to escape it um there is no way in the sense that except you know the cbn decides to increase rates and you know you know, look at the trade-off between focusing on co focusing on your currency and, you know, working on your economy as well. The CBN right now is focused, and the government is, you know, focused on protecting, you know, our exchange rates as opposed to looking at the individuals within the economy. So um, I th the IMF, obviously, their advice has, you know, they, they, they keep, you know, creating that level playing field, pick which, which one works best for your economy. But at the same time, I don't think we can escape it as much because we're heavily reliant on, you know, the external, external economy. And uh, let's go to the commodity space now, starting with oil. Uh, oil was up this morning. We don't know what it is. I mean, the, the price. Cause, yes. And, uh, of course, it's reaction to expectation from the U.S. Fed decision and uh, the issue with Kazakhstan. Yeah, so, you know, you have supply disruptions in Kazakhstan. You have supply disruptions in Libya. Yes. But at the same time, I think what's most, most important is the fact that OPEC Plus has not been able to meet their, you know, their, their quota when it comes to increasing production. They plan to increase production by 400 400,000 barrels per day but most countries have not you know been able to do that so that's falling short and falling way below the demand 
that we're currently seeing in the market. Mm. And then uh, looking further at the commodity space, uh, we see that uh, goods, the price of goods is uh, elevated. Yes. Yes, so they're elevated just because, you know, you're seeing the fact that uh, there's the, the, what most analysts call it the individual aspect and also the climate change as aspect as well. We had seen the individual aspect, we had seen the Omicron virus and all of that affecting, you know, uh, supply when it comes to commodities, but also extreme weather conditions has been impacting you know some of these commodities for example with cocoa extreme dry weather is affecting our cocoa production in nigeria at the moment and you know that's obviously going to be negative for our, co our export earnings which is not great at the moment trying to be at, at a point where we're also trying to build our reserves you know find you know funds to you know fund the uh, 2022 budget as well. and so what do we expect uh, the harvest season is almost over or is over um it's almost over but you know harvest season comes in again at about Q2 this year so right now we're trying to enter the planting season and hopefully the extreme weather you know it doesn't disrupt you know some of the yields that we do get um, 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 after the planting season is over. So we expect price to moderate? Or? Moderate, keep the same pace that it is except something you know drastic happens in the markets regarding supply and demand. And uh, for oil, uh, what do you see? Well, we expect oil prices to range between, you know, 79, 80, 81 dollars per barrel at the moment, except, you know, we see huge changes in the supply. If, you know, OPEC comes in again in the next meeting and they try to increase, you know, supply, supply. the fact that, you know, supply is still f falling way short of demand, we will definitely see, you know, a, fall, a, a drawdown in the price of oil. And uh, Nigeria is still at, uh, I mean, our, our target is $62. Yes. Dollars. Yes. So, so um, it's what was what, what very cushioned for it, definitely. We're way above, you know, what oil prices are trading. And, and hopefully, you know, that margin, we still get it to fund. And you don't, uh, see, you don't see it going lo below that. I mean, I know, I mean, I, when, when I, we had I, the I think 62. I would be, I'll be more optimistic about oil prices. <laughs> than because a lot of people have not been so optimistic when they hear of 62. They think it's too close for coal. Well, um, I think with what is going on, with what we can see in the market, I think I'm, I'm very optimistic about oil prices remaining. Even, even if it's going to fall short, I don't expect it to go below $75 per bar, at least in the first two quarters. Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much, Bolanli Agbaje, a research analyst with FDC. Thank, thank you so much for sharing me. your thoughts with us. Thank you. So we'll take a break now. After the break, uh, we will continue this discussion on oil, especially as it concerns Nigeria and uh, crude production. That will be after the break. Stay with us. It's Business Morning on Channel Television. <laughs> Welcome back. Nigeria has a maximum crude oil production capacity of 2.5 million barrels per day, making it Africa's largest producer of oil and the sixth largest oil producing country in the world. However, statistics from the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries shows that the country's oil output remains around 1.2 million and 1.4 million barrels per day, despite opportunities to churn out between 1.7 million and 1.5 million in quota during the year ending. Well, reports also indicate that the federal government lost 1.47 trillion naira to 222 terminal shutdowns in the first 10 months of last year. What's behind this? What was it costing Nigeria? We have uh, Mr. Victor Epeyong, founder and chief executive officer of Kenyon International West Africa to speak to this. Uh, good morning, Mr. Epeyong. Good to have you on the show. Good morning, madam. It's my pleasure being here. Yeah. So we see here that uh, the federal government lost a lot of money, almost 1.5 trillion naira, because of shutdowns. We have issues of vandalism. Just, I think, last week or two weeks ago in Nembe, we had a spill, you know. Um, how much of a problem? Because at the end of the day, we, we don't meet up with the quota given to us by OPEC. How much of a problem are these to our uh, crude oil production and, of course, uh, the revenue of the country? Oh, it's, it's a very huge, huge problem huge problem for us as a nation because uh, if you look into our budget uh, when the, the federal government is preparing budget they prepare budget based on some economic uh, you know you know variables you know they look at how the budget is going to be funded and in Nigeria we fund our budget through the proceed of oil so if oil oil gas is ha is having an issue 
or maybe through production, transportation, or lifting, it actually going to affect us as a country. It's already going to affect our economies, and everything about us is going to be affected. All right. Uh, so we, we, we've been talking a lot about vandalism, oil thefts, you know, crossing the border, you know. Um, and, and, and I think the government, they've been making some efforts. You are in, you know, this sector. Tell us that how much impact has the efforts of the government been? Yeah, uh, the, government, the government is trying their best to, uh, to educate people about um, oil and gas assets. The need for us to protect our asset because oil and gas asset is our environment. But the government need to do more uh, because uh, uh, what river affect oil and gas actually is going to affect Nigeria at the moment because we don't have any other economic, okay, like the agri and some other sectors that just try yes. to come up. We've been talking about diversification for a while. Yeah, yeah. So um, um, the government need to do more, but I'm, I'm going to talk about the three you know, area thing that the government can tackle this menace, this problem. So uh, one is the government, two is the operators, and three is the host communities. So uh, the government uh, in terms of, reg because the governments are the regulators. So um, all is being, all in gas licenses being given to investors. So investors come in, bring in their money, invest, and government has shares. You know, sometimes in some GB you have 60, 40. So you now see, um, the, but there are regulators, which is before it was DPR now, you know, Nigerian upstream companies. So now the DPRs need to come up with some policies. What are the policies? Policies like what is obtained in other countries. Like if you, if you travel to a country like Malaysia, USA, and some other countries, you see that uh, there is what we call idle well management plan. Because most of these uh, vandalism you are hearing about today, most of them take place on wells that are idle. Because wells that are, being, uh, that are in production is actually being connected to the flu station. People are monitoring it. So whenever things are down, they will know. But wells that have been inherited from you know, previous operators, you, know, you see um, they don't have some type of pressures and have most dead tests. Maybe the pipeline was uh, harvested, so they just leave the well, maybe thinking that maybe later we'll come back to the well to work on them. So those are most of the wells that you see vendors have access to them and try to steal. Water River is, um, is, um, is the content. So now, what governments are doing outside Nigeria is to have a blueprint, is to have a plan. We call it idle well management plan. So that is the regulator. So they would tell all the operators, we want to see all your wells that I do. What are the plans you have for them? Do you want to bring them back to production? Do you want to temporarily abandon them? Or do you want to decommission them? So when these are being sent to the operators, the operator is going to send back the list of the wells. OK, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's I do. I, uh, I plan to bring well one, two, three back to production. Oh, I, I plan to temporarily abandon it. Maybe I want to do walkover and some other things to bring more production. Well, so, 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 so I want to decommission it. So that is the area we need the regulator to come in. It, there has to be an enforcement so that people don't have access to this well. So the operators will be more responsible. So that now comes to the operator, number two. Operator need to try much as possible to, to be responsible in their wells. Because industry best practices recommend that if you have a well that you are not you know, you know, producing, you should try much as possible to secure it. You secure it subsurface and surface. So subsurface is where maybe you run in a plug. So whatsoever come down from down holes won't be able to have, you know, come to the surface. Surface is just what you try to protect the integrity of what we call an x tree. So the operator also have a responsibility there. The last one is the community, the host community. The asset belongs to Nigeria. Like I said before, every oil and gas well drilled in Nigeria, government has percentage part of it, operators, and some there are a lot of people that have interest. So the host community also need to protect this asset. This asset belongs to us. And who are the government? We are the government. We elect whosoever that represents us. We need to protect what belongs to us. Because if 
this thing continue the way they are, you are saying, uh, I, uh, it, there's going to be an economic shortfall. Uh, federal government is going to look for more money to even clean and up the we'll environment. And borrow more. And we'll borrow more money <laughs> and as, uh, as the case may be. So, mm. so we need to come together, the government for more regulation and enforcement, the operators for being more responsible. And the host community. The yeah, host communities. I mean, once you mentioned happened. host communities, uh, we, we just got a picture of people who are not happy, who feel cheated out. I mean, I, I don't know if you saw the videos of, uh, I think you were part of, you know, dealing with the Nimbe situation. You know, the host communities are more like victims. So when you put responsibility on them, I mean, they're telling you, look, we're already being victimized. So why, how do you expect us to contribute? you know, to, to this uh, uh, Okay, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have been in work control for some years now. So it just, the one that just happened recently that uh, because it was in the media, we have been, uh, tack you know, tackling uh, blowout, well blowout. And based on our experience, we discovered that blowout usually happen when some wells have been left unattended to. And people try to have access to the world, either to steal the contents or whatsoever that is in the world. So that's like the idle well the that you well mentioned earlier. I may mention about. So now, where the host community come? I know they feel cheated. There is no problem, but there are other there are other wells to for you to channels your, you know, <clears throat> you know your grievances and whatsoever. Mm. There are channels to do that. But when it comes to the environment, is your environment? Is your is your waterways? Is your land? Is everything? So. Tomorrow, the oil company will not be there. They are going to decommission. Okay, today now we are talking about transition, transition, transition. A time will come in Nigeria, you see that most of these wells, like you go into some platforms, you will not see anything. They're going to decommission them. So you're going to take, you're going to take responsibility about the environment. The environment belongs to you. You channel your, you know, your grievances, you know, some, some other ways you can okay. know how to channel your grievances. All right, so uh, we also always hear of illegal modular refineries. And uh, I think I've been a part of a conversation where we say, is there no way of channeling these modular refineries that have been tagged illegal into, you know, economic benefits? Is there no way of doing that? Yeah, I, I think uh, some years ago, I read well, in the newspaper, so when people were like trying to encourage the government, say, okay, if these people have the capability, if they have the technology, to do this, why don't you, you know, incorporate? Why don't you reach out to them? Why don't you see what we can do? You know, at times, um, I'm, I'm not in government, but I, I, would, I would think that there are some, uh, uh, when you don't know people that are doing some kind of businesses, how would you help them? So I think if some people maybe will come up to say, ah, I'm into refinery, I need help, I need loan, I want to acquire more e equipment. Because what is going on in the illegal side of it is that it's, it's just damage to our environment. Like in Port Harcourt, yeah, so we have a, lot, a, lot, a lot of them have been arrested. A lot of these uh, modular refineries have been seized. I mean, can't we work from there? It, uh, I've, I've not been to anyone before, so I don't know how it looked like. Because, because I know before you, you cite a refinery, there is a lot of things that need to go. Yeah, it's always the small onto. thing, most so, of them water. So, you know, uh, 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 when you see things that are done manually, uh, uh, as, as a professional, you will now look at how can I improve these. So there yeah. has to be yeah, environmental impact assessment. There are things you need to do before you cite a refinery. So I think that uh, if some people can come up and approach government, Say so we have the technology to do ABC. We can actually do this. Mm. I'm not in government. I think maybe there is a, a way of to a government can assist us. Okay. So uh, the PIA, the Petroleum Industry Act, has been signed. What difference do you see it making to the industry? Yeah. Um. Uh, I I watch uh, the JMD sometime last year when he went to the US. He made some statement about the PIA. So um, what I can say is this: we are about going into transition, moving from fossil fuel decarbonations and a lot of things that is going on. So I think it was a wonderful and wonderful idea to enact this law. Because when you're about to transition into cleaner energy, yeah. you need investment. You need people to come in. And when you want to bring a visitor into your house, what are you going to do in your house? You try to tidy up the house to so make the sure PIA that we help us tidy up tidy up so if you check 
the PI is all about transparency. It's all about, do you want to invest in Nigeria? Nigeria is a place you can come, invest, and you'll get your return of investment. So the PIA is going to help investors to come in. And uh, you see, the NMPC is trying to focus on gas, because gas is the future. So if you are coming into Nigeria to invest in gas and to see how to you know, boost Nigeria economy, that means that the PIA is going to assist you. It's going to help you. It's going to tidy up the system. It's going to make the system more transparent so that whatsoever you invest, you can have return of your investment. I think that is what the PIA is all about. Mm, in my own, uh, my own, uh, uh, you know, you know, perspective. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Victor Ekoyon, Chief Executive Officer of Kenyon International West Africa, for thank sharing you. your thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for having me here. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, we do hope, at least, uh, dealing with the idle wells, will be one message that is, that goes out yeah. from this conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. To look into it. Okay. Thank you. So enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much, ma'am. So moving on now, uh, let's do the market. Uh, Will is not here, so I just have to take that upon myself. Let's start uh, from the equities market. How did we do yesterday? Thank God we closed in the green. The market was up uh, 0 0.1 percent. Uh, All share index is back. Almost 44,000 points. Equities cap 23.65 trillion naira uh, activity chart had a mixture of red and green going to the activity charts now volume was down uh, just about three three hundred and eleven million value uh, was down also eight point six four billion naira deals was the only one in the green when you look at the activity chart over five thousand there and the sectors it was a mixed it was mixed dangote cement did so well yesterday it was up four four percent uh, and uh, all share index, and then Boa Foods also, you remember, just, I think it's about a week now, they were the most traded stock. I mean, they're still a toast of the town. Now, well, we have Abdul Rashid uh, Momo joining us. He's a stockbroker with TRW joining us now to share his thoughts on equities. Uh, good morning, Abdul Rashid. Good morning, how are you? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Good to have you. So how, uh, yes, last week, uh, I think we closed up, and then we're starting the week in the positive. Are investors back in the market? Uh, where do I start from? Um, <laughs> I always look at the market as a cycle, how uh, the movement of how the stock market evolves. Um, mostly, I um, historically, the market has always done well in the months of December into January. You know what I'm and um, what we are seeing now is um, yesterday the market um, did lose some points because um, the market had hit a, a, a critical resistant level of 44,000 points, which we actually had in November, right? So the uh, market is going to play a lot of, uh, we're going to see a lot of activities here. Um, we, we won't see much price movement, but we'll start to we see more volume traded because we actually we need the year, year end has ended, so we are in we are waiting for financials to come, especially from the banking sector. So this will be uh, the kind of next level which the bulls will need to charge, because for what it is now, we are within the resistant levels. Market is going to pass here. The market pass is going to reach and going to be a huge volume. And um, the way the market works, um, I think Boa foods have actually played a huge role mm. in helping the overall index up. So give or take the market is going to be flat for now, but it's still a bullish outlook. Um, we'll be looking at um, the next levels we watch will be around the 45,000 level. So it's about wow. 8,000 more points to go. 45,000, that would be a very good one. I was also going to ask you about Boa Foods. Is it the influence of Boa Cement that is attracting? Yesterday it was the most traded by volume, by value, over 100 million units. Is it the influence of, you know, the confidence in Boa Cement? No, uh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good brand. And then you look at it, it's a, it's a strong brand. So um, I think that one is playing a huge role. And, you know, it was least, um, not many investors actually have those shares, and they want to lay hands on those shares. Mm. 
So at any point in price, I guess they must have. I wouldn't know what the intrinsic value of, of um, Boa is, but but what Boa is doing now, Boa Food is going to actually trigger some stocks. I think stocks like TZ, depending in the last two weeks, the area of Boa, all those other stocks who think they can't get Boa Food, stocks like TZ might start following suit, which we already seen lately. Then perhaps later in my start with stuff like um, Unilever Cadbury, something related to if you do food, because yeah, something that will trigger other people to move. I think the employer is actually doing that now. Mm. I guess so you're I right. I guess you're <laughs> right, uh, Abdul Rashid, because yesterday yeah. PZ was up, even though it couldn't lift the, the sector. So I guess I it's know. one player where people it, are going. It actually to. asked me, and I brought it down in the layman's plan. They said, this is food. Everything that is related to food, it will trigger. It's going to drag those guys up, and that's what actually we are saying now. Mm. You know, the market, you don't have to look at you. Sometimes you really need to bring, analyze the market like the normal market man or a market woman. <laughs> it depends on what much is going on, you know, that price they have. Yeah, when so you, you have to. Yeah, when you say you market, a normal market man or market woman, you know, just bring a, a picture to mind. But let's move to there and just look at the banking. Uh, towards the end of last year, the banking was the toast of a lot of investors, but it, we see yeah. that it was down yesterday. What's going on? Is it sell pressure, profit taking? Well, well, well the way I normally look at market, market dynamic is as a trader, yeah, I only tell you there are two players in the market, investor and trader. The investor looks at value. He knows what's going to get from such companies. As a trader, I look for entry points and exit points. Buy, sell, buy, low, sell, high. Mm -hmm. So basically, there was some analysis we did in the beginning of January. Um, stocks like Access Bank, they have a range. When it gets about 950, it shuts down. UBA finally broke. If UBA gets about 8 naira, it shuts down. Um, Lafarge, 25 naira, it shuts down. Then it's about 25 plus. So every price has a range. So within this period, the traders actually look for entry and exit points. So for me, for now, volume is taking place. The market is sideways. It's virtually flat. The only ones that move the index up are the poor foods, the SL, the MTN, and everything. But later, the banks will still play their own role. What we have seen that those stocks hit resistance levels, and um, those, those are areas where people like us will want to sell and book and look for lower prices to buy again. Mm. All right, Abdul Rashid Momo, thank you so much uh, for this analysis of the market. Okay. Enjoy no the problem. rest of your day. Have well, nice just day. thank you. But just before we go, let's uh, give you a little bit of summary of what happened in other markets. NASD, uh, OTC market yesterday, the All Share Index was also up 0.68%. Market cap was also up. Good day for the NASD market. Uh, the uh, market cap was 636.05 uh, billion naira. On the activities chart, we saw over 442,000 transactions valued at uh, more than 10 million naira and 20 deals. Uh, yesterday, going to the bonds market, the federal government bonds, we see that the, the toast of yesterday was the 18th of March, 2036. Uh, six deals on that uh, uh, alone, and we see the maturity uh, for the maturity at valued at 20.6 billion. And then uh, total, we are on the FGN bonds, we saw 26. Uh, NTB also had just one. CBN had four deals. Normally, this would be very, very quiet. Omo had nine deals, and uh, well, that's how much we can take on the market. Let's take a break now. When we come back, we'll head straight to London, where Julia and I are standing by to stay with us. <laughs> You're welcome back. Of course, you're still watching Business Morning on Channels Television. Now we head to the UK. Getting over the impact of COVID-19 seems a very long way away, not just in the UK, but globally. But we have uh, Juliana joining us from our London studios now to give us details from the UK. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. 
Good morning, Guinea. Yeah, so um, we, we saw a report from uh, Heathrow Airport warning uh, about a lot of, obviously, flights uh, cancelled last month when we had Omicron and, you know, a lot of restriction. But what's the implication of this warning that they are bringing to the fore at this time? Yeah, unfortunately for Heathrow, which is uh, Britain's busiest airport, things don't seem to have uh, got any better in 2021 in comparison to the year before, where some would have seen that uh, COVID was at its height. Uh, they released figures showing that just 19.4 million people passed through their terminals. This is only a quarter of what they had pre-pandemic times. In 2019, there were over 80 million. And in 2020, there were over 21 million. So things haven't got better. Uh, for them. Also as well, December, which is uh, usually uh, the most busiest uh, time for international travel. Lots of loved ones um, like to uh, travel to go and see uh, one another. But that wasn't the case because Omicron struck and therefore, according to Heathrow, there were 600,000 cancellations, uh, several reasons. Some of the restrictions that were put in place uh, by uh, uh, local governments were very last minute. Testing uh, its a big, big issue here in the UK, very costly, especially for large families who decided that actually uh, they would rather um, stay at home. And then, of course, just concerns about Omicron and what the future would have in store for it. So, yeah, pretty disappointing uh, figures uh, for Heathrow. Of course, January is a very quiet month for international travel, but they're hoping things can get uh, picked up. But they're still asking uh, the government to make sure measures are even further relaxed if they are going to uh, recover from uh, this pandemic. So do we see this uh, role uh, to end COVID uh, PRC, PCR tests for some asymptomatic uh, uh, cases in England? Do we see it making any, any difference? Well, not for Heathrow, no. Um, this uh, new announcement um, is really uh, just trying to uh, curb back um, uh, some of the shortage issues that Britain is currently facing. So uh, prior to the announcement that was made, um, if you tested positive uh, with a lateral flow test or an antigen test, that's one of those tests that give you the results almost instantly, but within uh, 30 minutes, what the British government was advising people, well, uh, making mandatory, is that you would have to follow it up with a piece PCR test, but we know that Omicron um, is uh, was spiralling out of control. I believe it's fallen for a sixth day here in the UK, but there was a point over 220,000 people were testing a positive, and it was difficult for people to, to find one of these PCR tests. I believe Britain currently has a capacity of 800,000 uh, PCR tests a day. They were hitting almost 700,000 um, in late uh, December. But what they're saying now is that a, a lateral flow test, if you don't have any severe symptoms, so if you're asymptom asymptomatic, as you said, uh, you don't have to follow it up with the PCR test. But if you have the main symptoms, which I believe is a continuous cough, high temperature, loss of taste or smell, then you should uh, book um, a PCR test. And uh, away from COVID now, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve decision is really putting a lot of economies on their toes at this time. Uh, how are you guys preparing for that uh, decision and announcement? Yeah, so everybody is waiting uh, for the, the, the biggest inflation uh, data of the year. Thus uh, far, tomorrow about lunchtime, uh, London time, we'll be getting that announcement from the U.S. Federal Reserve. I believe um, lots of economists are anticipating that inflation in the, U in, in the U.S. could reach by about 7% way above that 2% target. Domestically, Britain's inflation is currently riding at about 5.1%, again, more than double the Bank of England's benchmark. I think really where the world's largest economy goes, global markets really follow. So yes, we are all waiting to see. I think here in Britain, especially within uh, the square mile, why they've been shielded slightly uh, by the kind of worries and anxiety over um, a rise in interest rates, which is what we're expecting to happen if inflation does get to that 7%, is that a lot of uh, tech stocks um, that um, have done really, really well um, in New York during the pandemic, we don't really have that here. So in one way, there has been a loss because we don't have those growth stocks but in other ways we are shielded by a rise of interest rates if 
um, th that uh, J Jerome Powell decides to do that. So in a way, yes, we're all waiting and watching, but I think um, the, the UK blue chip index could be shielded. Thus far, it's been really great for banks. Banks, just in uh, the 11 days that we've been in the year, they've all been riding high. Barclays, NatWest, HSBC, Lloyds, they've been doing really well, up by more than 10%, because, of course, if interest rates rise, then their profitability, profitability which has been hampered during the pandemic, increases, Any. Yeah, well, it looks uh, like uh, you guys are not as, uh, or will not be as affected as we will be here. But we're all waiting for the U.S. Uh, and we'll see how what they come up with. Thank you so much, Juliana. We'll talk to you later on in the day. Thanks, Ine. So let's move to the crypto space now. And Ladi is standing by. Yes, Ine. All eyes on the Fed. And you see the yes, crypto market. Yes, affecting all markets. All markets. We've seen <laughs> sell-offs with tech stocks. We've seen Bitcoin sell-offs. So... All eyes on the Fed. Let's see what the decision will be. Let's see if uh, inflation in the U.S. won't be as high, but everybody thinks it's going to be high. We see the market cap there, $1.96 trillion. It's uh, down 0.71%. 24-hour volume traded in the crypto market is up about 46.93%. And Bitcoin dominance, 40.77%. The price of Bitcoin, uh, we did the breach at the 40K level yesterday. Uh, got a, a sharp spike from there. I uh, see Bitcoin at this morning trading at 42,000. It's up 0.46%, 24-hour volume traded in Bitcoin, uh, $33.42 uh, billion. Uh, we see Ethereum there also breaching uh, the $3,000 mark yesterday. At, at, it's uh, now had also had a, a quick spike from there at $3,115. Uh, but this morning it's down by 1.55%, 24-hour volume traded uh, $19.97 billion. The top odds by, by market cap, we see it's all red there. Uh, from uh, those uh, sell-offs we saw in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, let's uh, bring in uh, Rume Ofi now, Digital Market Analyst. Hello, Rume. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. Great to have you. So it's all about, you know, regulation again. We've seen the U.S., uh, Turkey, Parliament, and, uh, the, and India all weighing on uh, regulation uh, for the crypto market. It's a big one. What are your expectations? Um, I, I think... Uh... The, this country you just mentioned, and a few, uh, I think they're a bit confused. So that's what technology does. This very one actually is disrupting everything, you know. But um, as, as it goes, uh, as it goes, as the day goes by, they are going to improve on it. For example, that of um, India, the central bank has, has actually come up, set up a fintech department, you know, because uh, just for just the result that uh, Bank of India handling some some of these things it becomes. Um, very, very good for them. You know, their job is just to, for monetary policies and all. You know, so this is the model that I think uh, makes um, makes a lot of sense. And also, I think uh, Turkey, uh, which is no longer uh, a secret thing that last month, uh, last year, November, Turkey actually, uh, their currency, the lira, the Turkish lira, actually lost about 30% uh, compared to the, when compared to the US. Dollar. So they're coming up with. Um, a deal uh, in the legislative, um, the, in the legislative house, the parliament, sorry, uh, to come up with how this can help the economy uh, and make a lot of sense. But there's something about the U.S. that I think is, you know, with the fact that Gary Gessler actually has talked talk about blockchain and cryptocurrency in um, MIT. The U.S. yesterday, the Fed yesterday was asked uh, if um, Ethereum was the security, and his answer was he said, he said someone, uh, something that has raised money from the public could be considered uh, worthy of that definition, which only means that uh, there's some uh, misunderstanding here. You say that uh, Ethereum is a security, and Ethereum is actually, in terms of market capitalization, the second in the market cap. And FinSec is coming out to say no, no to Ripple which has happened, I think, in December 2020, and Ripple has been in that case now for a while. You know, I so guess the it, argument it, continues it, there. This discrepancy, discrepancy between what is a security and what is not security. And again, they are coming to attack ICO. So I think this regulation is something that we take uh, gradually, of which some of these countries are getting, are getting it right, and some have not looked at all, most especially in our case of Nigeria. It right. is very dangerous if regulation is not being given the desired attention because all that is to be going on underground, which might be harmful to the, the citizens of that particular society. All right. 
All right, Rumi, I guess uh, 2022, the year of regulation, we'll see how it all uh, plays out. Thank you so much, Rumi. Thank you very much, Adi. All right, top of the market cap, I said before, it's all red with Solana, the biggest down there is down 4.33% at $136. Uh, so in it, it's, uh, it's a red market. We still see, you know, blood on the streets. Uh, but who knows? <laughs> this market is unpredictable. You might guess, see a bounce. I guess that's why I have red, because there's blood on the street. Yes, it, it goes with your color. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Uh, but you did call 2022 the year of regulation. It's not yet the year of regulation until Nigeria is part of it. I hope you know that. Well, yeah. It's not I'm just sure about Nigeria's the U.S. Gonna, and Turkey and all that. Nigeria's going to fall in there at some point. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ladi. So that's it on the program. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Let's do it again tomorrow. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Thank you.